Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is 2021. <sighs> 2020 is over. Let's hope that 2021 brings us good stuff. Let's just go with good stuff. <laughs> that is my hope. I hope you had a wonderful holiday season and that your new year is going well so far. We, as usual, are here to talk about a book, uh, books, a book in particular. Uh, Today I'm interviewing author James A. Ross about his debut novel called Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. This is a historical fiction book uh, about, as you guessed, Teddy Roosevelt. It's 1909 and Teddy Roosevelt is leaving office in a funk. Much of what he had hoped to accomplish as president remains undone, and his controversial decision to follow George Washington's example and not to run for a third term now seems like the biggest mistake of his life. Though he leaves in spectacular fashion, assembling the largest safari ever undertaken and leading it on a year-long expedition through East and Central Africa. Roosevelt is not only hunting in Africa, he's being hunted. James Pierpont Morgan, the most powerful private citizen of his era, wants Roosevelt out of politics permanently. Afraid that the trust-busting president's return to power will be disastrous for American business, he plants a killer on the safari staff to arrange a fatal accident. Roosevelt narrowly escapes escapes the killer's traps while leading 264 men on foot through the savannas, jungles, and semi-deserts of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Congo, and Sudan. The safari is also a time of discovery, personal and political. In Africa, Roosevelt encounters Sudanese slave traders, Belgian colonial atrocities, and German preparations for war. In his personal life, he struggles to help his teenage son and safari companion deal with the Roosevelt family curse of depression and alcoholism. He also reconnects with a childhood sweetheart, now a globe-trotting newspaper reporter sent by Roosevelt's enemy, publisher William Randolph Hearst, to chronicle the safari adventures and uncover the former president's future political plans. Surviving all, Roosevelt returns from Africa alive and begins his campaign to regain the presidency. But J.P. Morgan has no intention of giving up. Can Roosevelt's dynamic vision for the future of America, Europe, and Africa survive the machinations of one of the world's wealthiest men? So there you have, I love that very detailed description that is on the back of the book. You now have a very good idea of what Hunting Teddy Roosevelt is about. Like I said, it is historical fiction, but while I was aware of the the safari that Roosevelt went on, I mean, most people probably know that he was a big game hunter. And I mean, he collected some amazing specimens, and those specimens are still on display and and have been used in lots of different studies. It it can be a little disturbing to to read about the the, uh, extent of the safari, the number of animals that were collected. It's, yeah. Anyway, uh, while I was aware of that safari, I was not aware of the threat against his life, which is not made up. I mean, it's not something that uh, James just came up with. He actually found an article that pointed to this attempt on Roosevelt's life, and then he expanded on that article and imagined what must have happened, did a lot of research, looked into the, looked into everything that he possibly could in terms of this story, and then wrote this book. And I want you to hear his words on all of this, because he, of course, tells it much better, and I don't want to give too much away. So let's go ahead and turn to the interview. Again, the book is called Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. The author is James A. Ross. 
Hi, James. Welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here, Sarah. Happy to have you. We are here to talk about your historical fiction book called Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. Before we get to the book, though, if you would share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Well, uh, at various times, I've been a uh, Peace Corps volunteer in the Congo, uh, CBS News producer, a low-level uh, uh, aide to an uh, Illinois congressman, a Wall Street lawyer, and now I am a debut historical novelist. Very good. Nice. And you live in Wyoming. I do, in the beautiful uh, Teton Valley, where there are more elk than people. Yes, <laughs> which is very cool. Um, yeah. I love that. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, the book is called Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. Can you give an overview of the story? Basically, this is the story of an attempted assassination of uh, ex-President Theo Theodore Roosevelt while he was in safari on safari in Africa following his second term as president. Um, Roosevelt uh, probably was the most popular president since George Washington and could have easily had a third term for the asking, but he decided to do what he thought was the right thing and follow Washington's example uh, and not run again for a third term. Uh, and instead he, um, he decided to go on safari uh, there were no presidential pardons or pensions in those days. So Roosevelt, once he left office, had to make a living. And he, um, he signed a contract with Scribner's Magazine to do a series of articles chronicling the, the safari, the purpose of which was to collect um, specimens of African game animals for the Smithsonian Museum and the New York Museum of Natural History. What Roosevelt didn't know, and that's really what this book is all about, is while he was uh, hunting, he was also being hunted. Uh, there was an assassin sent to uh, uh, make sure he did not return from Africa alive. And um, uh, fortunately for history, the assassination attempt then, as well as one later uh, when he returned to the States and ran again for president in 1912, we're both unsuccessful, uh, but this is the story about the first attempt, and the uh, reason I decided to write it is so many people uh, don't know about it. It's uh, not in history books. It's not in the various Roosevelt biographies, and uh, the answer to the question why is equally as fascinating as the, uh, the assassination attempt itself. Yeah, why why isn't it it more well known? Um, it, it was mentioned that there was a small article in an Italian newspaper, and that was pretty much the only press it got. I mean, you'd think it would have been bigger news. Uh, yes, and you know when I ran across it, um, it, it raised all sorts of interest, interesting questions. Uh, one, of course, is why isn't it in the biographies, and why was it in? Uh, isn't in any of the uh, English language newspapers. You know, who who would who would have and would have had the power to suppress it? That's one question. The other, equally interesting, is why send an assassin to try to kill an ex-president uh, who's on his way to a part of the world that in those days would you know probably do him grievous harm anyway. This is you know before uh, penicillin. Uh, uh, 911 and, and and so on and so forth. And this guy is off in the jungle of Africa for, for a solid year, totally out of communication with the civilized world. Uh, he may very well not come back alive anyway. So why send somebody to kill him? And, uh, you know, hunting Teddy Roosevelt is an answer, attempt uh, in the form of entertainment to answer both questions. Um, as far as why it's not in history books, my theory is that um, um, most of the uh, American newspapers that had um, the resources to um, uh, have international news coverage at the turn of the century were all controlled by William Randolph Hearst. And um, Hearst himself uh, intended to run for president in 1912. 
and looking at the coverage in the Hearst newspapers, including the International Herald of, in 1909, you see the coverage of the Roosevelt Safari is all about um, the slaughter of you know, game animals. It, it, it's designed to make um, Roosevelt look like a uh, animal killing buffoon as opposed to a serious politician. And my belief is that Hearst simply suppressed the story in an F and and other stories in, in order to deny Roosevelt the kind of coverage that would enable him to come back from the safari and run as a credible candidate for president again. The second question, of course, um, you know, who would have tried to kill an ex-president um, is a bit more difficult to answer. Um, you know, sadly, uh, in modern times, we're all too familiar with the assassination uh, of or attempts on the life of uh, politicians running for office or, you know, sitting presidents. But, you know, in 1909, Roosevelt is, um, in essence, a political has-been of his own choice, uh, and he may not return. So who would want, who would expend the effort and resources to, um, to try to make sure he doesn't come back from Africa alive? Um, that's why hunting Teddy Roosevelt is fiction as opposed to nonfiction, because my answer is, um, in truth, speculative. Uh, my prime candidate is J.P. Morgan. Uh, it's pretty well documented that Morgan and others bought the uh, Republican convention of 1900 that nominated William McKinley. And McKinley, as a sop to the Tam Tammany Hall, uh, added Roosevelt as his vice president, even though Roosevelt was of the opposite political spectrum within the Republican Party. McKinley was pro-business. Uh, Roosevelt was very progressive, in, you know, in the uh, in the modern sense. Well, unfortunately for the folks who bought the convention, McKinley was assassinated six months into his term, and they got Roosevelt for the next seven and a half years, which was not what they paid for. Um, in fact, he spent Roosevelt seven and a half years um, breaking up uh, business monopolies then known as trust, trust, and basically being a total pain in the neck to uh, J.P. Morgan and others, you know, who ran Wall Street. So, uh, if you ask who would benefit from Roosevelt not coming back from Africa alive to run for president again, uh, the answer is pretty straightforward. The the folks whose uh, lives and pocketbooks were impoverished by uh, Roosevelt's uh, administration. Yeah, it's it's all fascinating, and it's just like I said, amazing that we don't we don't hear more about it. And on that uh, little bit of history, not very well known history, we are going to take our first break. And when we come back, James will be talking more about where he found this story, how it germinated the idea for the book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Podcast. I am enjoying some historical fiction talk with author James A. Ross about his debut novel, Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. Before the break, we were talking about um, what the why Teddy Roosevelt was not only hunting but being hunted. And so, let's go ahead and return now to that interview. Where did you first come across the story, and was that your jumping-off point for the book? Um. The jumping off point of the book was uh, a meeting I had with my then agent. Uh, to, uh, w at what was supposed to be a um, 
a book signing for a murder mystery I had written. And uh, at the last minute, the uh, the publisher called and backed out. And this was 2009, the crash year. And uh, my agent um, uh, said, well, look, you know, the publishing industry is in turmoil right now. We're not going to be able to do more with this book right now. Why don't you write another? And, uh, you know, let, let's, uh, you know, kick around some ideas. Well, I'd spent some time in uh, Central Africa as a young man in the Peace Corps and then with CBS News in the Congo. And I'd always wanted to write a book set there. So I wanted to write a book set in Africa. And um, my agent's idea of, you know, what might make a a popular book um, was pretty straightforward. He, his idea was, uh, you know, exotic locale. Okay, check Africa. Larger than life character and global stakes. Well, I had met some of the larger than life characters of the 1970s while I was there, Idi Amin and others. But I couldn't quite, you know, figure out how to make that into a book. And as I'm uh, uh, just doing some basic research, I ran across Teddy Roosevelt's book, African Game Trails, and fell in love with it. It's probably the best safari book ever written. And, um, you know, he's a wonderful writer, and he, he really brought that time and place alive for me. So I'm thinking, okay. I write about Central Africa, maybe Roosevelt's the main character, you know, what might have been going on in the safari. And I started researching the safari and I plugged in um, Roosevelt safari and the name of the liner that brought him to uh, Africa, which was the SS Hamburg uh, German liner. And bingo, there pops out this little uh, blurb really. And, uh, an att- uh, Naples newspaper from March 1909 that reported the Carabinieri, the Italian police, had taken off the ship um, carrying Roosevelt to Africa uh, when it docked in, in Naples a um, an anarchist who allegedly had tried to uh, kill Roosevelt with a knife while he was on board. And that was the genesis of the story. I, I mean, that caught my attention immediately. We raise the questions we just talked about, you know, who would do such a thing at that time is an ex-president and has been, you know, why isn't it in the American newspapers? Because I spent a year looking for anything at all in English. And eventually I found two things, uh, reprinting the Italian blurb in newspapers that um, uh, were not controlled by Hearst and um, had uh, virtually no circulation. And that's it. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, that, that's how it came about. My, my first comment is I, I love the, the sort of offhand comment from your agent of, well, just write another book. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I'll get right. <laughs> give me, give me, give me an hour. I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, well, so, well, I was probably the last on his long roster of, uh, authors at the time. I think, uh, this book that we were trying to sell, he had uh, uh, convinced me to cut about a third of it in order to uh, um, meet the commercial parameters of mystery novels of the time. And, um, you know, I'd asked him to help me out with it because, you know, as you might, may know as a writer, after a certain amount of time, your eyes glaze over and you don't know flesh from bone anymore. And his answer mm-hmm. to me was, no, I, I can't do that. You're on your own. I'm working with Ken right now on his book. Ken, <laughs> is Ken Follett, and the book was Pillars of the Earth. So, right. I mean, <laughs> I knew exactly where I stood in the pecking order as his, his <laughs> writers at the time. Something oh, that was goodness. repeated, by the way, when um, Hunting Teddy Roosevelt came out. I don't think there's a worse time possible for launching a, a book then in the first global shutdown of bookstores since Gutenberg invented the printing press. But um, yeah. second to that is having to come, uh, having those bookstores finally open and realizing that one of the groups that could not work from home during the shutdown were book printers. And, um, and then finding out that in that backlog, you are not at the head of the list for having your books printed. You know, Steve, you know, um, 
you know, uh, Stephen King and John Grisham and all those folks or Ken Fott are ahead of you. And you just have to wait patiently in line while the book printers get back to work and the bookstores right. um, fill up with their books and not yours. So um, it's no fun being an author if, you know, you're, well, actually it is fun being an author, but there are many different ways you're told where you fit in the pecking order. And uh, the pandemic created a new one. Wow. When it came to writing the book, um, talk about writing historical fiction with so many well-known characters, especially the fact that Teddy Roosevelt is, is the main focus of this book. How was it um, writing a, a novel about such a larger-than-life person such as Teddy Roosevelt? Uh, fortunately, my um, career put me in contact with um, you know, the d different kinds of people I could draw. Uh, um, I, I spent, as I said, some time on Capitol Hill. So I, you know, had a good feeling for politics and I spent most of my, um, uh, working career after that on wall street. Um, you know, and, and was pretty familiar with the JP Morgan types. And I think the key to writing historical fiction is to, or any kind of fiction really, is to back away from the larger than life aspect of some of these people like Roosevelt and Morgan and concentrate on the human. You know, what do we all have in common? Uh, one of the things I hope comes across in Hunting Teddy Roosevelt is the humanity of the father-son relationship between Roosevelt and his son Kermit, who was um, you know, suffering from depression and alcoholism and uh, later succumbed to it. I think that human aspect um, allows, you know, people to um, appreciate Roosevelt the man as opposed to the, um, you know, the public figure who's, you know, in part the creation of media. And I think that's, that's true of all historical fiction. You may be dealing with larger than life characters, but the key to making them real and uh, understanding them is to focus on their humanity and what they and we have in common. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, just that bringing that relationship in to the, the story, I think, really, really does help because it's it's a larger than life character. It's also this really grand, epic safari. I mean, just the scope of the safari is amazing. Um, I, I can imagine it would have been easy to get caught up in just in, in trying to describe everything that happened on that safari. Um, so I, I think bringing in that, that relationship was, was really key. As we head into our second break of the podcast, I will just say that I've, I've said before that historical fiction novels that include real life characters whether that's just a cameo whether they have a fairly large role whether I mean it's clearly about Teddy Roosevelt in this one that's a pretty large role uh the the writing of those historical figures always fascinates me because I enjoy reading about them and having them appear in the books that I'm reading but I feel like I would be way too intimidated to write them like I I would just feel constantly like I was doing them a disservice in some ways so I'm grateful that other people do not have those feelings or if they do they're able to overcome them and and write those characters so that we have historical fiction in in such a way that the characters are true to what we know about them even if the story around them may be somewhat fictionalized very fictionalized what have you Let's go ahead and take that second break. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, the book inside the book, which is Teddy Roosevelt's um, novel about his, not novel, excuse me, um, writings about his time in Africa. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
from news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I am speaking with author James Ross about his book, Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. Before the break, I tried to say the name of Teddy Roosevelt's book, and I ended up stumbling all over that. Uh, It was actually called African Game Trails, and that is where we pick up with the interview. You mentioned Roosevelt's book, African Game Trails, which I'm sure does describe the, the scope of that safari. How did that book then influence or inform the writing of of your book? I used it as the um, skeleton of my book. Basically, it follows uh, Roosevelt's safari from, uh, you know, British East Africa, you know, what's um, now Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Um, And, um, you know, he spent a year on foot, you know, 264 men, um, carrying 40 bundles on their head, walking uh, across uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo, and the Sudan, and having you know, adventures along the way. I used Roosevelt's uh, book and, and his itinerary and even many of his descriptions of the hunting scenes um, and told the understory, uh, basically, while he's you know, focused on his mission of collecting uh, animals for the Smithsonian and and the New York Museum of Natural History. What's going on below the surface are, one, somebody's trying to kill him, but two, and perhaps more importantly, um, he's realizing uh, as he encounters the complex um, political situation in Africa at the time, which mirrors the preparation for uh, uh, what was to become World War I in Europe, uh, he realizes that he has to come back and run for president again. It's just what he sees in, in a Congo, with, um, you know, genocide on the scope that rivals the Holocaust. Uh, he sees in, in Germany, East Africa, obvious preparations for war. Um, and, you know, comes to the conclusion that, uh, um, he needs to play a role. He needs to come back and uh, lead America again and perhaps um, redress the colonial atrocities in Africa and broker a peace between England, France, and Germany involving a readjustment of their colonial empires, which would uh, uh, hopefully avert World War I. And of course, had he been able to do that, you know, the world would look different today. If, uh, you know, he came very close to winning the election in 1912. If he had, I doubt there would have been a World War I. And if we didn't have World War I, we wouldn't have had World War II. And without that, you know, uh, China, or Japan, not uh, China, would be the dominant power in Asia. And the Middle East would not look as balkanized as it is today. And the place of the U.S. in that new world would be entirely different. Now there's a there's an alternate history <laughs> book if I've ever heard one. Um, well, how we long came very ever... close. Yeah, yeah. How long did you spend researching before you wrote the book? Uh, two years. Okay. So it was probably and... two years of research and two of writing. Okay, that is impressive. What are you working on now? Um, I just signed a contract for a 
three book um, mystery series. Uh, coincidentally, the first book in the series is the one that uh, uh, my ex agent wasn't able to sell in 2009. Uh, it's called uh, Cold Water Revenge. It's uh, coming out in April of, uh, I guess it's 2021, uh, about five months from now. And uh, it's about two brothers uh, involved with, romantically involved with the same woman and the troubles that ensue when uh, they discover she's a murderess and one realizes the other is helping her cover it up. So it's that, a bit different from that, Hunter, Teddy Roosevelt. But, oh, uh, it was yeah, fun a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And you said that was a series? Did I hear that right? Yes, it's um, the first in a three-book series. Okay, that is fun. And um, it's nice that you were able to then get back to that book that, that was had to be put on the on the back burner in 2009. Um, there are so you know, many you... stories in writing the film about projects that take ever, forever to bring to fruition. It's almost a yeah. common place, but it's a, a, it's a testament to the perseverance of the arts, I guess. Absolutely. Are there other writings of yours that you would like to talk about? I mean, I know you've got some short stories and you've done other types of writing. Is there anything else that you would like to highlight? Well, um, you know, for listeners who are interested, I there are many stories, uh, both written and performed, on my website, jamesrossauthor.com. And one of the things I would love feedback on is um, whether one of those um, performed stories uh, would be of interest to the reading public if I were to expand it into a book. Uh, I told a, a story for the Moth Radio Hour, which is up on my website, uh, involving uh, a, a pretty hair-raising adventure that um, uh, I and, and my then-girlfriend had in the Congo uh, in the mid-1970s, getting caught up in a civil war there, and the um, you know, the dare-and-do adventures of uh, staying one foot or one step ahead of the uh, rebel army trying to uh, overtake the uh, the government uh, forces in the uh, the town where we were uh, uh, refugees in, and, uh, and and how we finally got out. Uh, if your readers would care to hear that story, it's on my website, uh, jamesrossauthor.com. And if any of them think it would make a good book, uh, it's certainly one that um, I've to I've been toying with writing. Um, I just um, uh, you know, I have to get through this uh, three-book murder mystery series first and fulfill that obligation right. before I get to it. But if I have my druthers, that's my next project. Okay. You have had a very interesting career path. Um, how, when, blah, blah, sorry, when did you start writing and is it something that you, you'd always wanted it to do? Well, my, my um, you know, dinner party response to that question is I, I wrote my first book in college and I published my first one the same year I started collecting Social Security. So there was a long <laughs> gap in between. Um, again, you know, the arts are not for the faint of heart. If, you, uh, if you've got the itch, you're going to have to scratch it, whether you can make a living at it or not. Uh, it depends a lot on chance. Um, and, you know, there can be a long time between when you start and when you finally start getting a, 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 some recognition. Uh, in my case, it's been my entire adult life. I have a son who's uh, also got the, the itch, and he's out in L.A. now trying to break into Hollywood as a screenwriter. And his worst nightmare is it takes him as long to get traction as it took his dad. But <laughs> I assure him I'm probably an outlier in that regard. Let's go ahead and take our final break of the podcast. When we come back, uh, James will be giving his advi advice for aspiring authors, aspiring historical fiction authors. And so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
world and state media concepts social media podcast time to hashtag everything we talk about all the fun crazy stories on social media from instagram to facebook twitter to tumblr or probably even friendster join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media it's the golden state media concept social media podcast it's simple it's simple such a sad song Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author James A. Ross. Do you um, have advice for aspiring authors? I do. Um, I would encourage anybody who's got the storytelling bug to explore all the different avenues for expressing it. Um, I improved my own fiction writing greatly when I uh, discovered uh, oral storytelling, which I now do a lot of at at different venues. Uh, As writers, you know, we, um, there's often a long gap between the the creative product and the feedback we get on it, you know, sometimes years. And, you know, it's, it's the reality for most writers that they can spend months or years on a piece of work uh, and then start sending it out to agents or, or publishers, um, only to get the feedback of, um, you know, thanks, but no thanks with nothing more. You don't know why, you don't know what's not working, you know, and so on and so forth. In oral star- storytelling, you get, you not only get feedback, you get immediate feedback. You know, you're up there on stage, you've got an, uh, a live audience in front of you, they're there to be entertained. You tell your story, and you know within a half a minute whether um, uh, you're, you've got you hooked the audience or not, and um, and sometimes you know why. I mean, one of the things I learned uh, early on in my storytelling was not to make an assumption that your audience um, gets your cultural references, um, and this is particularly useful in. Um, for writers of historical fiction. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of, of hunting Teddy Roosevelt was uh, um, to cram some history into the book without slowing down the narrative. And, uh, but I realized I would have to cram some history into it because I couldn't assume that everybody uh, knows who Teddy Roosevelt is or what his story was about. And I learned that through oral storytelling. I, I was up on stage uh, at a bar here in Wyoming, and I was telling a, a story from my youth, so it was set in the Vietnam War era, and I referred to Ho Chi Minh. And I looked out at the audience, and I realized, you know, as an audience of, you know, work, the working folks of Jackson, Wyoming, who are out for an evening's entertainment, so they're all in their 20s and 30s. And I realized they don't have a clue who Ho Chi Minh is. They probably think it's a you know, it's an entree at the local Thai restaurant, you know, not realizing it's the uh, uh, name of the leader of Viet- North Vietnam during the war. So um, you learn you learn things like that in oral storytelling. Okay, you can't assume your audience knows the history. You got to get it in there. Um, the challenge in the art is to uh, get the history in without slowing down the, uh, the narrative so that, you know, it's no longer in uh, a entertaining novel, it's a history book. But I, I would recommend to uh, you know any aspiring writer that they try the uh, the oral storytelling as well. There's a lot to be learned there. Thank you. That's really cool. Nobody has has brought up that um, that bit of advice before, so I I think that's really helpful. And um, it's always interesting to to think of what what people are familiar with in terms of history or cultural events it's it's uh 
yeah, <laughs> I, I keep seeing, I keep seeing things on, um, on Facebook about Y2K and kids, you know, I mean, my niece is 20, so she's not even familiar with Y2K and the, the whole big deal that it was at the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, you just, you have to kind of think about what your, what your audience is going to know or not. Yeah, the flip side of that, or, or maybe in a, to another facet, is if you write historical fiction, uh, and it's uh, or, or any kind of fiction, and uh, you use contemporaneous references, your right. audience today may get all of them. If you, you know, if you're writing a book in 2000, your 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 audience could be assumed to know what Y2K meant, but your book may not stand the test of time. If somebody picks it up 20 years later, um, the uh, common cultural references of that era uh, are going to be unknown to the new audience. And um, that demands a bit of thought as you sit down and compose a story. You know, today's audience may, uh, you know, get it, but what do I have to do to make sure that, you know, my grandkids get it if they happen to pick up the book, you know, out of a dusty trunk one day? Exactly. Yeah, that is fascinating. When you take time to read for yourself, who are your favorite authors and what genres do you tend to be drawn to? Uh, well, I don't know if it's oddly enough, but for a fiction writer, I read very little fiction. Uh, most of my reading is nonfiction, and it's uh, history, uh, uh, spirituality, uh, and um, travel. Uh, and uh, in uh, in a fiction area, I'm still a you know a fan of Hemingway, as I think most writers of my generation, um, yeah, you know, we learned at the master's foot of uh, how to write simple declarative sentences and uh, you know eschew uh, purple prose and and uh, uh, highfalutin description, uh, but um, uh, in my own personal reading, I, I've uh, I've gravitated towards uh, nonfiction. That actually kind of makes sense, given. Um, I mean, I, I only know you from one book, but uh, nonfiction kind of makes sense from the the book that uh, you have written. So, <laughs> uh -huh. you've you've mentioned your website, um, and so can you remind people of the website of the the address of the website, and then also if you're on any social media where they might be able to find you. Yeah, the uh, website is jamesrossauthor.com. And I also have a uh, author's Facebook page, which is james.a.ross.author. All right, thank you. James, we've talked about um, a few different things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention, whether in terms of writing in general or about the book, Hunting Teddy Roosevelt? I think we've covered the, the landscape, Sarah. Uh, it's been fascinating. All right. Yeah. Yes, it has. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, and I, I so appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about your debut novel. Thank you once again to James for, again, taking the time to talk to me about his de debut novel. Is there an echo? Do you feel like you just heard those words? Uh, I do always appreciate the authors who join me. I hope I convey that. I mean, I, I do very much appreciate talking to all of the authors that I speak with, and James is no exception, so I am grateful for him joining me on the podcast. I am, as always, grateful for you, my listeners, who join me every week to listen to new author interviews to learn about new books. I hope that you are finding lots of new ideas for books to read. I hope your TBR list is growing by leaps and bounds and that you have found some new authors and some maybe maybe even some new genres that you hadn't um, before read too much in. That was grammatically incorrect, but you get my point. Thank you to you. And I hope if you are a fan of this podcast and you have not already done so, you would consider following us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you, um, again, are a fan and would like to help us out a whole lot, if you could 
leave us a review, whether that's five star or you write us a review that really, really helps us to continually get the podcast out to more people who love books. And so I would be very appreciative if you were able to help us out with that. It is time to wrap up this podcast, but um, there are more to come. So join me next time when I am speaking with author Mark Watson about his new book, called Between Conversations. It is a collection of short stories, uh, nine stories from a world that is historic, modern, and futuristic. It is um, sci-fi fantasy in that genre, so join me for that conversation. In the meantime, I hope you're having a wonderful week, and I hope that that week, as always, involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program